This is Interstates. I'm Alex Chambers. And before we get started, I want to give you a heads up. Almost none of this episode takes place in the Midwest. It's about Baltimore. Apologies to those of you who come to Interstates only for our incisive, cliche-busting stories of Hoosier life. Next time, I promise, we'll be back home again in Indiana. This episode is about Justin Carney. He's an artist. He recently finished an MFA at Indiana University. Hey, there we go. Justin's art is focused on his family. He takes photos of them and makes installations that explore regret and grief and love. I went to talk to him in June. He was just wrapping up a stint teaching at the Heron School of Art and Design, and we were surrounded by boxes because he was getting ready to start as an assistant professor of photography at Colorado State University in Fort Collins. We talked about what his grandmother meant to his family, the slippage between grief and guilt, and why the challenges of making art can be a good way of working through all that. Public radio is radio that matters, and our sustainers keep it going strong year after year. Thank you for your support of WFIU. Justin got started as an artist because of his older brother. He went to magnet schools for art, starting in middle school. That seemed like a good idea to Justin, so he applied to the same schools. And I was always rejected. I got rejected from every single one. <laughs> he had wanted to follow in his brother's footsteps. And everybody was like, no, no. <laughs> the schools were like, you can't do that. And so, like, there was a little bit of a chip on my shoulder. <laughs> so he went to a regular high school. It meant the art classes weren't as challenging as he wanted. But there was photography class. They got to develop film in a dark room. Seeing the photo up here felt like magic. But I wasn't very good at taking photos, at like creating engaging photos. Very hard. Composition's (laughs) tough. (laughs) Uh As well as like the manual controls, I didn't really understand them. And so it was a challenge. And I loved not being good. And I loved I loved that challenge. And it's still challenging now, especially composition. (laughs) Especially composition. And so after I took that class, I took a whole bunch of other art classes, too. But photography is really what stuck. Because it was the hardest? Yeah, it was. (laughs) I guess that. Yeah, I guess that's why it was the hardest thing. (laughs) It was the hardest thing. So he wanted to figure it out. His mom bought him his first film camera and he started taking pictures of everything. When he finished high school, he wanted to go straight to get his Bachelor of Fine Arts, but his family didn't have the money, so he went to community college. He did that for about five years and decided he wanted to be a photojournalist because he thought for a photographer, that was all that existed. I mean, other than wedding photography, which I definitely (laughs) did not want to do. Then he got into a Bachelor of Fine Arts program, and suddenly his classes were about how to use photography as a form of personal expression. And that really opened my eyes. What to do with that? I had no clue, but... I know that I didn't want to be a photojournalist anymore. He kept taking art classes. He was liking it, feeling good. At a certain point, he realized people around him were starting to graduate, which meant he was getting close, too. And the thing was, everyone else seemed to know what they wanted to do with their work. And I didn't know. Like, I had no clue. I was just doing assignments for classes. So he sat down and made a list. What mattered to him? And the thing that kept coming back was his family. So... He started taking pictures of them, his mom and her sister and brothers. But then another question came up. Why was he doing this? Why was it so important to take these photos, make these images to keep? And then I started thinking about my grandmother. And then I started thinking about that guilt and the grief that was going on in my whole entire family. Something had happened to Justin's family. From the outside, it might have looked like the normal course of life, but it changed things within the family. And Justin, whether he should have felt responsible or not, and I'm just going to say now, he definitely shouldn't have, he was carrying a lot of guilt.
When Justin was growing up in Baltimore, his family was tight-knit, emotionally and physically. When he was young, he lived with his brother, his mom, his mom's brother, and their mother, his granny. Uncle Todd lived next door. Aunt Cheryl and Uncle Mark had their own houses nearby. They'd do cookouts at Uncle Mark's, and then when Justin's mom got a place outside the projects, the gatherings moved to her place. Probably because Granny was there, still living with Justin and his mom and brother. Granny was the gravitational force at the center of it all. She was just this very important figure, but she wasn't, like, scary, you know? She kind of, everybody gravitated toward her, even though she was pretty quiet. Justin's mom says she was so quiet that she didn't stand up for herself much, not even with her kids. But my uncle tells different stories, Uh, the oldest uncle, Uncle Mark, and he says that, like, they got in a fight with a neighbor together, that she stood up for herself because this neighbor was causing problems and was starting some stuff. Okay, wait, can you tell that story? (laughs) If I can remember it all correctly. So he tells it, like... This neighbor that they had had, like, come to the door. I don't really remember what the particular issue was, but they were starting some kind of argument. And this neighbor, and my grandmother had answered the door. My uncle wasn't downstairs yet. But the neighbor had, you know, put hands on my grandmother. And my uncle saw that. And, like, they started to tussle. I don't know what that means. They being your grandmother. Your grandmother and the neighbor. Yeah. I don't know what the tussle means, but my uncle says when he saw that, he jumped in. And, like, they both started tussling with the neighbor. (laughs) Tussler or not, her children loved being around her. Michelle Louise Carney was my mother. She was life. My, she was my mother, my father, my father, my friend, or anything she asked me, I'll get it done. Justin interviewed some of her kids about her, and he sent me the mix he made of their voices. She may have not had a lot of money, but she was great. She, she raised five kids by herself. herself. Mark was a strong one. My grandmother would go to the bar, and my mom would follow her. And while my grandmother was, you know, drinking, my mom was drinking a Pepsi. Like at the bar with her? At the bar with her, yeah. And so, you know, she would always follow her mom around. It wasn't even just her own kids. So this is a a little embarrassing story here. Uh, (laughs) But I slept in the same bed as my grandmother until high school. Like... I did not want to be away from this woman. (laughs) I I feel like I was just like my mom uh, in that way, because she describes not wanting to be away from her mother, right? And so I guess I took that. I took after her (laughs) in that way. It kind of sounds like all your mom's siblings would have done that, too. Probably. I mean, you know, yeah. Maybe not sleep in the same bed, but, you know. (laughs) Totally, like, they they just always wanted to be around her. Everybody wanted to be around her. Like, everybody. Everybody. But one thing grandparents remind us is that our time on Earth is limited. Justin was 18 when his grandmother passed away. When you're 18, you're starting to feel a sense of your effect on the world. You're making choices about your own life, and maybe you're starting to see beyond yourself to how you affect the people around you. For Justin, it meant in this moment of intense emotion, he felt an almost magical power. It wasn't real. He knew that. But it created a shadow that followed him for years afterward. She passed away in my mother's house. She was in the hospital for a little bit, and then she came back to my mom's house and... It just wasn't the same. She was in the bed most all the time, mostly sleeping, like rarely awake. There was this one night that I was in the room with her and she asked me, I think she asked me, like, do I think she's going to die? 
And, you know, I'm, I'm just a kid, you know? And, like, she's expressing these fears and all of these things. And, I mean, I've, I told her no, but I didn't, I didn't really believe what I was saying at the time. I didn't feel like I believed it. Because, like, it, there she is and what I can see as pain. Pain, fear, and all of these things. And I'm a kid and I'm just like, is, is living, is continuing to live good, you know? And so that, yeah, that, that moment was, was a, a struggle there. And that's something after she passed away that stuck with me. I actually blame myself for her death because I don't know exactly when the timeline uh, exactly lines up, but when she asked me, you know, if she's going to die, and I said no, and she expressed those fears, I had written in my journal... May 21st, 2011. ...that I hoped she would, you know? Sometimes I think she should just die so she wouldn't have to suffer anymore. Or maybe that's not exactly right. Maybe I think she should die so I don't have to see her suffer anymore. And I wasn't sure if that was for my own relief or her relief at the time. And she passed away shortly after. And so I felt like my words had power, you know, and I blame myself for that. Justin wasn't the only one who felt that day as a kind of watershed. On the night that she passed away, so everybody was there, my mom, uh, my aunt, my uncles, and and uh, my uncle Mark, he had left, and yeah. you know to go home to take a shower See, to fun. get a little that bit of rest. It. I had been there for a week already, and I left. It was on a Sunday. <laughs> It was on a Sunday. So, I don't know, it was probably about seven, about eight, nine o'clock. It was dark. And me and my wife, Angela, came home. Let's go home. Let's get some rest. Well, she, it was two o'clock. I was actually watching a movie in my room. And my room was directly across from my grandmother's room. So, I heard everything that was going on. And so when my mom came to knock on the door, I pretended to be asleep. Because I felt like if I opened the door, then it would be real. And she was knocking on the door. I was leaning up against the door, preventing her from opening it. But, you know, I I didn't want to cause more pain for, you know, my mom, for everybody else. And so I did open the door. My brother had fainted that night. My Uncle Rod was very distraught, and so my mom took my uncle upstairs with her to console him. And my Uncle Todd left the house, and he had to go on a long walk, and he didn't want to come back into the house. When she died, I had lost all hope for myself. Because as long as she was here, and I knew it, I could do better. And my Uncle Mark, rushing back, driving furiously back, despite being too late. The way he says it is that he was just like seconds too late. Like she had passed basically as soon as he parked. My aunt, as well, you know, taking care of people, because she's a nurse. And so, you know, she's also, everybody's just going through their own, their own pain in different ways. Some people apart, some people together. And so, you know, that kind of, my grandmother's still alive, everybody's in the same room. My grandmother passes away, disperse immediately. And so there's that fracture that happens immediately. (music) 
And so after she passed, for about, I would say for about like five, six years, it was a, a real struggle to get people to come to the house, to come together, especially all at once. Something about the individual ways they were grieving made it hard to see each other as much as they used to, hard to talk with each other, which made it a loss upon a loss. They didn't just lose their mother, they lost each other too. Justin spent years feeling bad about it. He'd lost his grandmother, and then also that closeness in his extended family, and on some level he felt like he'd caused it all, like he'd cast a spell with the things he'd written in his journal. This is what he was carrying with him as he studied art in college. Except that, like most of us, he didn't even really know what he was carrying. All he knew was he had signed up for a large format photography class. Is it like the kind of camera that like, you have a cloth and you kind of put your head under it? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly it. Yeah. Hold up a flash that goes... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I didn't have any flash. I, I like... I like natural light, but okay, cool. that's that's what yeah. you see in the movies. Right. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's the exact same camera. And all he wanted to do was take photos of his mom and her siblings. When we come back, Justin's going to find something to do with those photos and with his grief and guilt. They say when the student is ready, the teacher will come, or at least the right course number. In Justin's case, it was a class on artistic installations. He had to take a collection of his individual pieces of art and turn them into something people could interact with as a whole. It meant thinking about bigger ideas. What I ended up doing was facing that guilt, uh, bringing that in, because I felt like that was the best opportunity to really face that guilt and to kind of have help like from the audience of getting over that guilt. Uh, like, how is the audience helping? Yeah. <laughs> so the project... It was all about how the project was displayed. He had two walls, the corner of a room. He took a bunch of family photos of his grandmother, mostly toward the end of her life, and blew them up to 24 by 30. He put those on the walls along with enlarged images of his journal at the time. The journal entries mostly say what was happening. Not a lot of emotion. But then, on the ground, there's more paper. More enlarged journal entries. These are torn and crumpled up, and these are the pages from his journal that he feels bad about, where he made wishes that came true, and all the negative emotions he felt afterward, blaming himself, calling himself names. And so the audience, the way that I brought the audience into it, is because these journal entries are on the floor, and you have journal entries on the wall that are meant to be read, the audience has to step on the journal entries on the floor, these negative Mm -hmm. emotions, which by having them step on it signals to me that those particular emotions aren't, they're not real. Like, they're not true. They don't have to hold as much weight, you know? Do you remember how it felt to you when people were first interacting with it and walking on those? It was scary. (laughs) It was, it was definitely scary. Um, Especially even more scary when my uncle and my mom you know, we're interacting with it because, you know, I, I hadn't told anybody my feelings of like how I felt guilty or what I even said to my grandmother. That conversation with my grandmother, I, I didn't tell anybody about it. But that conversation also was in the mm-hmm. or in the piece. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was really scary. But I hide my fear really well. (laughs) But I I had a lot of people walk up to me. And this has happened with, like, a lot of my exhibitions. People walk up to me and they tell me their stories and their feelings and how they connect to it. Uh, Strangers, you know, telling me about how their mom had passed and how, you know, it's so hard for them to deal with those feelings and that. Somehow my work helps. Justin's photography wasn't just changing things for his audiences. In taking pictures of people, before it even became like interviews or things like that, just taking pictures of people, things started changing again. You know, everybody more so separate, but taking these photos, talking with people, being around my family members... They started 
like opening up more and with you or with, with each other with me um i would say that like i would say things started getting back to you know people gathering all at once after i started doing like interviews because one of my questions was like how do you feel the relationships changed with everybody and so it really made them start thinking about that maybe maybe it really started <laughs> pat yourself on the back a little oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah you know i asked them questions about their mom i asked them questions about you know their joys their regrets their relationships with each other did taking photos create like another kind of intimacy with your family members Oh, yeah, for sure. Because with the photographs, what I would do is I would go over to their house, right? We schedule a time. Uh, I'd go over to their house and, you know, we'd go through their house together, trying to find a good spot to take the photo. Because it's such a slow process, I would have conversations with them. And this time it wasn't about my grandmother's, but just like conversations with them about their lives and everything. Before I started taking pictures of my my family members, I would say that our relationship may have been a little more on the surface. Okay. Like it was it was more okay, we have this connection, we're family. We're I supposed to love each other. Yeah. Sure. And of course like it's real love, but yeah. you know, <laughs> but after the photos, like learning about them as people beyond just like my aunt and my uncles yeah. and my mom, I could love them as people, you know? Cuz like they were family in this and and being family they kind of weren't people in a way. Like partly cuz you then you were also like you were an adult and so you're able to, like, then you're suddenly, like, actually relating to each other as, like, two people. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like. Yeah, that's exactly it. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, like, making the photos, through making the photos, I think the connection started to reform. Differently, because my grandmother's not there, but reform. I had a conversation with one of my friends just last night, actually. And we were talking about, like, autobiographies, how people write stories about themselves. And she was talking about how she feels that people who do that are very narcissistic. (laughs) And (laughs) and I was having a conversation, and I was telling her my my thoughts, because I make work that's very personal. Exactly. (laughs) I was thinking that very thing. Yeah. 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 And I was like... For sure, there's totally people who are narcissistic and who exist out there right. and, and do that. But I like to think that most of the people who do share personal things in an art way, art way, uh, <laughs> <laughs> what they're trying to do is connect. Like, they felt something for their lives that helped them in some way, and they feel that maybe it'll help somebody else. And, you know, it's the same when I make work. Like, I mean, often the work that I make is me going through things. Like, I'm in the moment going through things and making the work. (laughs) But I share it because maybe it'll help other people also share, you know? Because people's stories are important and that's what helps us connect with each other is like hearing other people's stories it helps us connect with ourselves yeah and like sharing it's not just that people's stories are important but like sharing the actual sharing of the story is mm-hmm. is important yeah yeah sharing the stories sharing the feelings yeah especially like regarding death because like living in america or at least the America that I've experienced, people have experienced different kinds of things. But talking with other people too, I I would say that a majority of people don't really share their grief. 
And so going back to trauma, grief can become traumatic when it's just internalized and it's not shared. Yeah. Has it helped? Uh, (laughs) I would actually say yes. So when I first started making work, I mean, my work has been birthed from fear. Like fear that, oh no, my family's going to die. I don't have a lot of time. I have to do something. I have to make these things. And through making the work and through like interacting with my family, I can appreciate life more. I would say that like in talking about death, I have a greater appreciation for life. And that's kind of, that's kind of what I want for everybody. <laughs> that's yeah. that's kind of the goal is having a deeper appreciation to what you do have, what is still here. And honestly, making work about death it's got me thinking differently about death. Like yes, the person is no longer here physically, but they're still with me. And they're with me in different ways, so that spiritually, but as well as, like, being raised by my mom has made my mom a part of me. Like, I am a bit of my mother. I am a bit of my uncles. I am a bit of my aunt. And so they're there by me just being alive. Like, I am an amalgamation (laughs) of them you know and so yeah no one's ever actually really gone my uncle rod he calls every month that wasn't the case before that's a more recent thing he didn't always do that he calls every month you know to check in uh calls you yeah he calls everybody uh, he calls everybody and you know he's calling to really keep that connection you know to let everybody know that he's still here he loves us and he's thinking about us and he cares and i'm not too annoyed it's just usually when he calls i'm like doing something (laughs) and so i normally can't answer right away Like I'm in class or something. But I am really appreciative of it. And it's something that I want to implement within my own life is letting people know that I care. Just expressing that openly. You know, just even if it's just a simple text, right? Like sending just I love you to my mom and my brother sometimes. Yeah. Maybe not calling them. Yeah, I know. (laughs) Phone calls aren't too much my thing. (laughs) That's it for the show. We'd love to hear what this made you think about, whether it was about your relationship to your family, experiences with loss or creative work, or something else. You can record a voice memo on your phone and send it to us at wfiu.org slash interstates. You can also send an email. We might even talk about it on a future episode. Okay, we've got your quick moment of slow radio coming up. But first, if you like the show, leave us a review on your favorite podcast app. We'd love to hear what you were doing while you listened. Like... Maybe you've been feeling like you need a career change, and you want to influence the next generation, get fifth graders thinking about climate change, maybe. So you came up with this plan, and you went into your garage and turned on interstates to listen to while you built a DIY hot air balloon out of recycled grocery bags that you were going to take the students up into the atmosphere in to show them the awesomeness of cumulonimbus clouds up close. But when you started calling around to offer your educational trips into the sky... The schools were like, you can't do that. But luckily, you'd been listening to Justin Carney talk about photography, and you realized you could just take pictures of the clouds. And that's why you decided to give Interstates five stars. Like that. Tell us what it's like. 
Interstates is made by me, Alex Chambers. Our associate producer is Dom Hyab. Our social media master is Jillian Blackburn. Our intern is Carl Templeton. We get additional support from Aabon Binder, Natalie Ingalls, Sam Schemenauer, Peyton Whaley, Kate Young, and Lisa Robin Young. Our executive producer is Eric Bolstridge. Our theme song is by Amy Olsner and Justin Vollmer. We have additional music by Amy Olsner and Justin Vollmer and the artists at Universal Production Music. Okay, time for some found sound. was chanting at the Zojoji Temple in Tokyo, recorded by Carl Pearson. Thanks, Carl. Until next time, I'm Alex Chambers. Thanks, as always, for listening. Riding back at the top of the hunter's moon. soon.